We are so honored to kick off this year's Evening Common Hour Lecture Series with Kathleen King. Whenever the culinary faculty sat in a faculty meeting uh, with our department head, Lorraine Gauthier, um, we were talking about how can we contribute to the lecture series, and so we decided uh, that we would try to come up with some uh, names in a group, and so um, the first name that was mentioned was Kathleen King, and so never thought for a minute that we would be able to get her uh, to come here. Um, uh, most of the time when, when people introduce speakers, they give, go through a bio, um, and uh, I, I'm not going to do that tonight because if I go through the bio, I'll have to give you a spoiler alert for everything that Kathleen's going to talk about herself. But I'll introduce her kind of in a way that illustrates the brilliance of her brand. We were in our faculty meeting and one of our faculty members, Satoko Matthews, um, uh, is uh, Japanese and she went to Japan this summer for uh, a family vacation to see her family and friends who live there. And so um, Satoko was saying that when she, when you, when you leave the United States and go to Japan, you need to come bearing gifts uh, from the from the area that you come from. And so she thought, um, well, what can I bring from the Hamptons? And so the first reaction was maybe I should bring wine. And then she thought better of it and said, you know, um, I'm going to bring Tate's cookies. And so uh, she she uh, collected a bunch of uh, bags of Tate's cookies. Uh, packed them on the on the suitcase and went to Japan, uh, proud to give them to her family and friends there. And on her way to visit to uh, the family homestead, she stopped at a grocery store. And outside of Tokyo, Japan, she found the Tate's brand cookies. And so, Kathleen, good for you. Satoko, not so much. <laughs> and so. Uh, and so I said, I said to Kathleen before, I said, I said, and they weren't that expensive there. They were only about two dollars more a bag, a, a bag than you would pay for here. I have my own connection to the Tate's brand as well. Um, about ten years ago, I managed a, a fine dining restaurant in Southampton, and um, every day I'd go to work about you know one two o'clock in the afternoon. I would drive down North Sea Road. And I would pass this beautiful uh, Hampton Bakery uh, on the right-hand side, a uh, beautiful pale yellow building with a blue roof, very inviting, beautiful landscaping outside, and everything you'd expect in you know, Hampton-esque. And so I used to uh, find reasons to stop there uh, to get, uh, get uh, baked goods for uh, my staff on my way to work. But it has a personal connection for my family because I used to stop before every holiday and get the cute, I, I have two daughters, and whenever, I watch back there, she's gonna start crying. <laughs> well, I, I used to stop there for every single holiday and buy the most beautiful little cupcakes with a fancy decoration on it that was holiday related. I'd buy the little chocolate turkeys that you would put on the, you know, on the play setting at Easter dinner. And so, when I think of holidays, I think of you. I think of your family. And so as, some, as a professor who teaches marketing, and branding is a big part of that, there is no, Drew, you can hopefully agree with me, that there is no better way, there is no better compliment, there is no better loyalty than for a customer to be emotionally attached to your product. And so although you have sold cookies, <laughs> you have uh, made holidays at my house special. And I think that's a real sign of a brand. Right? Yeah. And so, without any more from me, uh, you're all in for a great treat. Uh, Kathleen is one of the most humble people that you will ever meet. Uh, she has a great story to tell, and I'd like to introduce her. Kathleen King, come and tell us your story. Thank you. Thank you for taking your time to come here. Before I start, I'll just do a little follow-up <clears throat> to show you how small the world is <clears throat> with Japan. You know how when you go down some that, that Google hole and you find yourself buying something? Well, I did that, and I was buying Japanese knives. And this one knife, it was a cake knife, and it was enamel, which J J Japan is known for their enamel work. Or a couple knives, they arrived from Japan, and inside the box is a note from the knife maker and said, you know, that I was the first person in the United States to buy the cake knife. And 
that it was an inspiration from his wife, who was a baker. So I was like, oh my god, that's so cool. And I, so I email him, because it was on the, on the note, and uh, I said, I just thought, since I was the first person that bought your knife in the United States, you'd like to, she'd like to know, maybe, that I am a baker, too. And I, you know, Tate's Bake Shop, a cookie company, da 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 He emails me back, and he was like, oh, we know your cookies. <laughs> and um, we're so excited. In October, we're going to come into New York and do an event. And would you like to be our so October 16th, I'm going into the city to be a guest at their event and to meet Mr. and Mrs. Wanakabi. Okay, now my story. Sorry, I have to write it down. It's only my story, but um, otherwise I go all over the place. I can't go all the things either. Okay. At 11 years old, my parents said I was old enough to buy my own school clothes, and I should take over my sister's one-year-old cookie business. At 14, she wanted a real job, at an ice cream parlor, to meet boys. <laughs> From the moment we could walk, we could work. So this idea of being responsible for my own clothes at 11 was received as just another duty. Little did I know that I was set on to my life's journey that would be filled with joy and upset finally ending in a 35-year career with a mind-blowing exit and the honor of being the number one cookie in America. My dad was what we called the slave driver, and my mother was the one to continually push you out of your comfort zone. A blessed combination that took me years to understand its gifts. I was an average girl with average looks and average grades. My desire to be a veterinarian ended when I realized in high school science was so beyond my abilities even with extra help and trying my best. Common sense was always my strong point, so my next thought was, maybe I can do something with these cookies. At that point, I was working 10 hours a day, seven days a week during summer vacation, saving over $5,000 each summer. This was the early 70s. <clears throat> I applied to a two-year SUNY Cobalt skill, paid my own way, and graduated with an associate's degree in restaurant management. I headed home to bake cookies in my mom's kitchen, clueless to what would come after that. As summer neared its end, Mom declared that would be the last summer I could use her kitchen, forcing my hand to make a decision. What decision? I had no idea, but something. She said there was a bakery for rent in Southampton, <clears throat> so off I went to check it out. It seemed the perfect time, fully equipped and affordable. I made a deal with the landlord in the spring of 1980 I opened Kathleen's Bake Shop. I was 21. The bake shop life was incredibly difficult. I worked 18 to 20 hours a day, growing to 170 pounds, taking one day off a week, and learning as I went along. It was so hard. I thought if I crashed my car on the way to work, I could go to the hospital and just rest. <laughs> I didn't know how to say, I can't do this. It's too hard. I had been told I had pride issues. In this case, it served me well, because it's the only reason I persevered. Three years passed, and I outgrew my space. Again, my mom says, there's a building for sale up the road. I thought that would be an impossible option. But she said it wouldn't hurt to call. <clears throat> I did call, and the owner was selling the building. He was willing to hold the mortgage, 9.5% interest back then, and wanted $50,000 down payment. I had 40000 and I knew no one with money. My dad always helped people the best he could. In the past, he had helped an eccentric older woman with her chickens in Southampton Village. During my search for $10,000, she died and left my dad $10,000. <laughs> so up I went, a real estate owner at the age of 23. No money left in the bank, a $300,000 mortgage, and a business plan that just said, I can do that. <laughs> the business and brand continued to grow, establishing a bigger wholesale business to avoid the hardships and pitfalls of a seasonal resort area. By the time I reached 40 years old, I was tired, missing a lot of my youth. I was ready to chill out a bit and took on two partners to help expand the business and focus on an exit strategy. This was not going to be the rest I planned on. I made a terrible business decision. 
giving away my company for no money, and I lost control because they now owned two-thirds of the company and I one-third. I guess I was not a mathematician either. <laughs> I was naive and trusting. My decision cost me my job, my company, my life savings, and took me to my knees for quite some time. Several lawsuits followed after they fired me. The partners tried to publicly destroy my good reputation. Every move I made was in the press, and the local community was in an uproar. Our little town turned into a made-for-TV movie. People protesting outside the shop, bringing husband back, billboards as you drove into town, tremendous support, and of course, judgment. This was not going to be my end game. After several lawsuits, <clears throat> we all settled seven months later leaving me with my beloved building that I bought when I was 23 years old and $200,000 of the debt that they drove my once profitable business into. I had no time to recover. I was still a bit of a doe in headlights, but I persevered. My mom and dad did not raise a victim. In one month, I remortgaged my bank shop building so I could get money to start a new brand. And within one month, created Tate's Bake Shop, named after my dad, opening in August 2000. My goal was to crush Kathleen's Bake Shop and to develop a real exit strategy. But first I had to create the new brand, get some money in the bank, and breathe the sigh of relief. During the fighting with my partners, they tried to blackmail me for a half a million dollars, or they would turn me into the IRS. I had a few choice words that I could sum up today as go ahead. They did. One of the partners was my bookkeeper, so he planted the seeds with the IRS and an investigation pursued. During this time, the investigation team seized my computers, investigated my life, looking for hidden treasures, I assume, put me through handwriting analysis, and I lived the first year of Tate's, thinking I was going to jail for 18 months. Or be under house arrest, which I had never heard of until then. I lived in a 550 square foot house at the time, and I never really had the right ankles for bracelets. <laughs> this challenge put me on the course that would take me to my successful exit strategy. I hired a business manager right away, assuming that I would be away for 18 months. I needed to get the business going and making money so when I was gone, the brand could flourish and I would have something to return to, plus I had to pay those debts. After a year of investigation with the IRS <clears throat> and fighting a union, but well, that's a different story, <laughs> that went on for seven years, I received a letter saying my partners were not valid witnesses. The case was dismissed. By this time, I had made great progress with Tate's Bake Shop, and my business manager and I were a perfect team. We continued to make decisions and execute for the following 14 years until exit. In August 2014, I sold Tate's Bake Shop to a private equity firm. I maintained 20% of the company, and I worked with the company doing quality control and recipe development. The transitions in my life from a small bake shop owner to epic failure, to recreating a brand, to an exit, and then corporate employee has opened my eyes to so many variables. I have learned about the world and myself without leaving town. <clears throat> I need some water, sorry. <laughs> Epic failure is success. <clears throat> it means that you are not playing it safe. It means you take chances and are not stuck in the comforts, the box that you built for yourself. Real failure brings about change and liberation so you can become who you were truly meant to be. Of course, I had typical failures along the way, but it wasn't until my epic failure that I was able to really grow. When I had Kathleen's Bake Shop, that was my baby. I nurtured it seven days a week, almost 24 hours a day. I gave up everything for it. Time went by, life went by. But I hung on to my creation, sacrificing everything for it. When my creation turned 20 and it evaporated instantly one night, the shock was unbearable. I took to sell health books and on occasion a pint of ice cream to make rhyme or reason of my new life. 
By the time I lived alone, <clears throat> by that time I lived alone, but had the support of family and friends, and I was happy for the solitude. This is when I learned to live in the moment and embrace gratitude. I would often say, what is my problem right this second? And there never was one. Only the pile was debilitating. I felt in my soul the blessings of family, friends, and a roof over my head, food on the table, and heat in the house. I was exhilarated by my good fortune. <clears throat> I learned I was in the biggest fight and trauma of my life, but my life was actually wonderful. I even processed the jail part, which was the hardest, into a moment of getting into shape and writing a book. I learned to turn the channel in my brain. When I started Tate's, I was fearless. I made decisions and executed quickly. Not being attached to ideas, thoughts, people, or things. In the early days of Tate's, I made a big packaging error. We tested it at the fancy food show in New York City, and people thought it looked like Girl Scout cookies. My business manager said, what do we do? And I said, throw it away, let's start over. He was shocked, as we really didn't have the money. I learned the best way to manage a mistake is to admit, fix, and move on. Don't get stuck. Don't be attached. Surrender to what is happening. Make decisions based on the moment. If the customers don't like it, they don't like it. This much I already knew. I learned that delegating work and empowering people gets more done in the end. I used to work hard, micromanaging and thinking that no one can do it as well as I can. Maybe in the big picture, but with overseeing, it's all good in the end, and the journey there was a lot easier. <clears throat> this gives your team room to be proud, because a paycheck is not enough, and in the end, earns you more respect as a manager when you empower others. I learned the worst part of confrontation is the time it takes to do it. I consider myself honest as a hammer, my strong point and my weak point. But I am free from sleepless nights and useless conversations in my head. Generally, you know within the first week if something or someone will work out. Don't make excuses. Confront, change, and execute. I learned from my parents and carried into both businesses. Do your best, no matter how small the task. Be honest. Take nothing that isn't yours, money, or praise. And always give back. I know it sounds incredibly basic and easy to execute, but if we all follow this, so many things wouldn't be such a mess. <clears throat> Had I not learned this in my childhood, my first success with Kathleen's Bake Shop and its demise could have been very different. I was a small town girl that did very well, but I kept a low profile and heard my dad say over and over my head, never forget where you came from. Without this integrity, my small town may have not have come together to support me at my lowest time. Dad even had a great philosophy when I failed. He said, how many people get to fall from such a high place? <laughs> it still makes me smile. As you become more successful, buy a bigger house, wear nicer clothes, drink better wine, always remember you are not better than anyone else. Opportunities and execution were just different. These lessons are what brought me to my epic sale of Tate's Bake Shop. And without this failure, I would not be here today. We may, we may call success money, but success is liberation. Liberation from ourselves, staying focused on the big picture. When business has its crazy moments, I would take a deep breath and I would tell my staff, we bake cookies. Remember that. Don't take yourself seriously. Have fun in your work and with the people that you surround yourself with, and the money will come. Once we liberate ourselves from all that holds us back, we can truly become successful. What is success, really? So many feel it's climbing the corporate ladder and making lots of money. But success is waking up happy and contributing to the world, not taking from it. Yeah. So 
Kathleen has agreed to take questions from the audience, and so we'd love to open it up uh, for anyone, especially some of you students. Yes. Where did you get the recipe from? Oh, well, when I first started baking when I was 11, I was back of the Nestle bag. And I was 11, so, you know, I threw stuff in. And then, once I learned how to measure, and then I measured properly what the Nestle bag said, I didn't like those cookies. So then I, I measured my mismeasurements to come up with my recipe. <laughs> yes? Whatever happened to Kathleen's gift shop, do the other people still own it? Yeah, no, you know, it, it like, after about two years, it just disappeared. I mean, even if I Google it, so like nothing. It's, like, it's, just, it's just like evaporated. It's so weird. <laughs> yes? How did you find your business manager, and how did you know they were the right fit? Oh, you know, I'm a big believer in, like, the universe provides. And I, I got tapes up and running. Then some friends asked me to go to California, and I uh, said, no, I can't go to Tennessee. And then I said at the last minute, you know, can I still come? And they were like, sure. So I went to California, and we were going, they were all going to see their friend, who I had just met <clears throat> when I was going out there. And I ended up staying an extra day that I wasn't planning on either. And that day is the day that Ray and I got to chat, and he said, oh, I heard you had a hard time, blah, blah, blah. And he said, you know, you need to meet my friend Michael. And I said, well, who's see, what does he do? And he told me. And <clears throat> so I said, okay. So when I got back to New York, I said to myself, I went to California. I wasn't supposed to go. I stayed an extra day. I wasn't supposed to be there. This is the information I received. Let me follow up. And then we just hit it off at, from, day, from day one. <laughs> Just lucky. Yeah. Yeah, yes. You ever like stop into a gas station, see your cookies there, and like, can I get these for free? <laughs> no, I don't even get them for free at Tate's. <laughs> I make my own. Oh my <laughs> yes. Were there any elements of your experience at a community college that uh, contributed to your success? Um, well, I was at SUNY Cobleskill. That was my only real college experience. Um, and, you know, the, the encouragement that I got here, I like a small school, uh, and the, the, the hands-on ex experience that I had with uh, my teachers and working in the labs and their encouragement and, and the extracurricular activities that I took up that, you know, I, we need a cake bake this weekend for such an, I'll do it, because I was such a, like, a loner. <laughs> the parties were all too loud, and people were smoking and drinking, and I was like, <laughs> so that's what I did, and, and uh, so you know, you didn't really get lost in a, in a small school. So I always felt their encouragement was really helpful. Yes. For your recipe, have you tailored it over the years, or has it been the exact same recipe? <clears throat> Pretty much the same, except when I had Kathleen's bake shop, I made the chocolate chip cookies with half butter and half margarine, mm -hmm. and. Then when I had to compete against Kathleen's Bake Shop, the only way I could up it was I went to all butter. Because <laughs> I had to win. <laughs> yes. At what point did you decide <clears throat> to trust again? Because yeah. you know, being betrayed like that is very Yes, yes. You know, in life when things like this happen, you actually make a choice. And I said to myself, okay. Because I'm generally not a trusting person, and I still am. I just say now I trust with my eyes open, because to not trust it, it makes every day hard. And so I just chose to just trust and just be smarter about it. And uh, I said I could look at these two guys that were kind of like borderline evil, and all this support I got from my, my community and from people that I didn't even know. So it was my choice. What do I want to look at? What do I want to focus at? And that's how I did that. Anyone else? Yes? What do you have to say to future business owners that people, you know, doubt them, but you're coming from something so small and look at you now? Yeah. Well, people are always going to doubt you. You have to always, you know, you have to believe in yourself. You have to 
<clears throat> you know, do your do your homework too, and but still, you have to believe in yourself. I mean, I had a cookie, <clears throat> the gin, the gluten free ginger zinger, um, that I made, and my business manager took it to Wegmans to sell, and he comes back, and it was still new, and he comes back and he says, you know, Wegmans didn't like it, so maybe we maybe we shouldn't do this flavor. And I said, what do I care what Wegmans thinks? It's great. <laughs> it's a great cookie. It sells, and it hasn't made the cut yet from Wanderlei's. So. <laughs> yeah, so you really just have to um, listen to people, but in the big, when you really, your gut tells you to, to, to keep going, you keep going. Because there's always doubters, always. I want you to know when you're ready to introduce your product, where, what was your steps for the distribution of it to get it out into the world? Um, just your business manager, or? yeah. I mean, I I had started um, in the wholesale business when I first had Kathleen's Bake Shop, and all I did was um, times are so different now. Um, was I, you know, uh, went into the city with my shopping bag, with my bags of cookies and a handwritten label, and I would like walk into Balducci and say, "Hi, like some cookies," and they were like, "Sure, let's try them. Oh, these are good, you know." Bring me, you know, 100 bags next week, and I'm like, yes. And then I'd, I'd walk into another store, and they would be like, you know, my mother makes better cookies than those, and I'm like, so. And then he's like, no. So I would just walk out, and I'd be like, loser. <laughs> That's how I did it. That's how I started. <laughs> so looking for the actual buyers of the product in each of these stores? Yes, and back then, the buyers were in the store. I mean, every, like, was... Right. This, everything was much more accessible, right. and we didn't have social media. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have to be so buttoned up to, just on day one. You know, my first bake shop, I took barrels, I painted them, and I put plywood on top and made a, made a tablecloth and threw it on top. And now people would be like, mm. I'm not doing that. I'm not buying that. <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate, but it was easier then, I have to say. Is your sister ever jealous that she went to work in the ice cream shop instead? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and that's you know that's such a beauty. Um, no, not at all. She became a nurse, which you know she absolutely uh, loved and was meant meant to be, and you know had got married, had two kids. That's you know um, the life that she always wanted, and uh, I you know I never had to suffer from that with my family. As a matter of fact, even when I <clears throat> sold my company to Riverside and the amount was really never supposed to be in the paper, and then it got leaked, so that was disturbing to me because I know like how money changes people and how money, like even if what money that you think I have, now you, you're changing now toward me because of that, and it's really weird for me. But my parents were alive at the time, thankfully, and nobody said a word to me. Just not one person in my family ever mentioned the money. Because that's how we were raised. You never ask anybody what they make, you know, and you never and you never really care either. And so they lived that until the till the end. <laughs> Could you have seen yourself growing to such a large scale if your mom hadn't kicked you out of her kitchen at the end of the summer? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, no, I don't think, well, first of all, I never saw myself really um, even when I opened Tate's and, and had my had goal, you know, to sell and retire when I was 55, I never dreamed of the level that, that we got to. And um, you know, my and uh, as you get older and you look back on your parents and stuff, you know, it, it I owe everything to them because because of them, it's how is who I am and how I survived my my journey, really. And my mother, her, you know, her independence and pushing me every minute. You know, I remember when I was <clears throat> young, younger, 18 or so, and I had Cobo I had to go to Cobo and I was going to drive there. But my friend was going to come, and she backed out. And then I, so my mother says, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm not going to go. I'm going to drive by myself. <laughs> and uh, she was like, well, yes, you are. And then she pulled out a map because it was back back in the day when there was a map. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and 
and wrote down and showed me, wrote down the directions, and then I'm like pulling out my like 66 black limit, and uh, she's, she's like, and I'm like, I could die on the side of the road. She's like, you'll be fine, go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, but then, you know, I, I arrived there well, in one piece, and it just opened doors because I no longer had that fear anymore because I did it, and I was like, oh, awesome. And now, you know, but if she didn't, wasn't like that, I, uh, who knows? You never know. Anyone else? How did you get into wholesaling? How did I get into wholesaling? Yeah. I got into wholesaling because uh, Southampton Seasonal Resort area and having um, summer help only every year was so challenging. So I said if I can develop a year-round business, I can have year-round employees and that would make my life better, which it did ultimately. Um, so I just started going door to door and yeah. saying, bye, Nicholas. Wow. Like that. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. So you said you've seen a lot of variables as you continue to grow. What do you think has been your hardest one or the most challenging for you as you continue? Um, you, uh, you know, employees can be the, the most rewarding and the most challenging. Uh, there, you know, you, you, you know, between retail and, and employees, I probably have a master's in psychology. Because <laughs> um, you have to, each, everybody's different. There's no, like, blanket. And the biggest um, thing I learned in transitioning from Kathleen's to Tate's Bake Shop, because that was kind of an opportunity, to, it was, you know, like, it's a wonderful life. You, you die, and you get to come back and fix what you see you didn't do well. So that, that was kind of a great advantage. And I think the biggest thing I learned in my transition from Kathleen's to Tate's Big Shop was to not be emotional. You want your customers to be emotional, but you can't. Because being emotional makes running a business very challenging and very difficult. And when you take the emotion out of it, um, you can execute and see things much clearly. And you can even practice it now in your day-to-day -day life if you have a decision you have to make, which you probably all do. And if you say to yourself, okay, if I take the motion out of the decision, what is my answer? Well, that's your answer. So stop making yourself crazy. Take the answer and execute. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just gonna say, at what point did you decide on your packaging, and how many prototypes did you go through until you got to that point? Uh, well, um, we had that failure, and then, uh, and then we went. Um, the the logo transitioned from when I first opened because that was like an emergency, like very quickly, and then we transitioned into the logo that had like the tulips and all, and the, after. The failed packaging, then we decided on another packaging, and that 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 worked for us. And ultimately, you know, the clear bag with the label was always the best. But now they don't make that one very often because it doesn't ship across the country. It, it's not as, as shelf stable. It's not um, safety packaged. So, and then when I sold to Riverside, <coughs> they changed the logo to what it is today. And Riverside, by the way, uh, last year sold the company to Mondelez, and now I'm 100% out. And Mondelez is a very large company that owns Oreo, Chips Ahoy, Wheat Thins, Toblerone, like, so they own Tate's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is the cookie still made in? East Bridges? Yeah. Yes, yes. When I sold, we were making a million cookies a week. And when Riverside sold to Mondelez, they were making a million cookies a day. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it's hard to. And then, you know, sometimes I can't really get my head around the, the, the mass of everything that had happened. So when Riverside sold to Mondelez, I had to sign a contract with Mondelez because they bought the rights to my name, my image, and my story for 50 years past my death. I was like, that's big. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of like 
hit home, it was like, what? So I, I keep thinking, I wonder, I wonder when I'm gone, how they're going to update me. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Did Girl Scout Council say anything about the packaging, or did? No, no, it wasn't like that, Girl Scout, but the customers' thoughts were Girl Scout. -y and <laughs> so we, we moved on. <laughs> Yes. I got two things. Well, Santa Claus must have been a really happy man coming to the Hamptons <laughs> with Tate's cookies around. And also, how does it feel knowing that you've inspired so many people in the, like, in the, in the, I guess the, uh, the industry, and knowing that like so many people are coming up, hearing your story, knowing that like, wow, this is what I want to be when I'm older. Wow. Um, you know, it's it's uh, truthfully, it's a little surreal. Like even, I mean, I've done this a lot, but every time I come and I see that you've all taken your personal free time to come to see and hear me, I'm always like, wow, that's amazing. You know, I, it's still like a shock because I, I'm, you know, I'm still like, you know, girl that makes cookies. <laughs> no, I'm like, oh, boy, <laughs> I do. Um, I don't bake a lot because I'll, it, I'll just sit on and heat it. But um, as, as I said, I, I make my own chocolate cookies now. Um, and uh, if there's if I have opportunities to bake, I, I do. And I still like to, to mess around and experiment with some things. And I just got this chocolate. Like, uh, the manager at the bake shop is, was still the manager when I was there, so I can still order things from the supply house from her, which is great because Bellona just came out with this new yuzu white chocolate that is good. <laughs> and uh, so I can st still go to the warehouse and say, you know, can I get, can I get a bag of that yuzu? I read that you were just coming out with it. So, and, but when she gets gone, then I will have that privilege anymore. <laughs> So, being that you sold to Mondelez, do you have, like, in, in the future, if you have any input on, you know, a new recipe or anything like that, do you have any communication with them at all? I, I have some communication, but I, um, really, I'm just a, a voice that floats in the air. <laughs> I don't have any, um, but I can't help myself sometimes, because just last week, um, in the New York Times mini crossword puzzle, Tate's was a clue. <laughs> It, it said, um, blank, bake shop, big cookie brand. And it was Tate's. And um, so I, I couldn't help myself. I, I said to the marketing person, you know, that puzzle would be really cute on a t-shirt or a mug, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'll look into that. I'm like, please. I was like, I wear it. <laughs> about marketing, um, what percentage were you working with traditional and then social? I know you were a little bit early on the social side. Um, what percentage? Like, were you spending a lot of time doing like traditional marketing or were you looking at internet marketing, um, online mm. ads? All of the internet, social media, etc., came at the end of my game, mm -hmm. which I was glad because it was not my thing. You know, my list manager was like, okay, now we got, we, you got to do a blog. And I'm like, hey, blog. <laughs> and then, uh, so they was like, ah. I was like, all right, uh, put some recipes. I was like, I'm not putting anything about my life on the blog. I'm not saying I had that for dinner. I'm not saying I made that for my friend. And then, so the blog, of course, was incredibly dull and failed. <laughs> very soon. Because I was very, um, it's, it's too much for, for me. Uh, so for us, for marketing, we spent most of our dollars really about getting cookies in people's mouths. Um, having tastings in store, donating cookies at various fundraisers, and, and doing things like that, the more of the, the old-fashioned style now. Um, and then the social media really was, and the online store and everything, was just really getting started um, before I left. I had just pulled questions and comments. You, okay. Since you're still very young, do you plan on building up another cookie to compete with tapes? No, I'm not allowed. <laughs> oh, all right. Maybe 50 years after I dial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I have a cookie I developed, and they won't make it. And I, I tell them, I'm going to set up a stand outside my house. You don't make that. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. I have two questions. Now, you said that Tate, uh, the name of that, was inspired by your father. Um, how so? Uh, his nickname was Tate because he was, um, he, he, when he was younger, he worked on a farm um, picking potatoes. And uh, he was five foot tall and very, mm -hmm. so he was like tater top. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so second question. What's your, um, what's your favorite recipe in, that involved with the Tate's Bake Shop cookies, like that oh. style of cookie? Well, you know, I've, I've tried a few different flavors and I like a couple. Of you know, my favorite, it's crazy, it, it's still chocolate chip cookies. It's hard to imagine most, most of you in the food business, you probably have your own experiences after six months, you don't, you don't eat the ice cream anymore. But I still love chocolate chip cookies, and when I make them at home, it's, I have to really work to not like eat five. Yeah, I, I, when you eat one, I have to eat another. I, it, and if this has been going on my whole, whole life, I said, that's one of those people that, you know, they say, oh, I, I ate ice cream all day for three months, and now I can't even touch it. I kept hoping that was going to happen, and it never did. <laughs> Through, what factor would you say has the biggest effect on profit margin? Was it like machinery or cost of ingredients, being able to buy in bulk? Was there any one thing that stands out, even though I know it all comes into play? I can't think of anything that particularly stands out. The, the cookies always had a great margin, so that well, that was good, and that is what also made it very valuable when I sold. Um, but as we grew, we could always we could buy better, you know. And the, the more we could buy, the, the better the ingredients. But as we're saving over there, you know, then you know, if the payroll's getting higher, uh, and, you know, health insurance getting higher. So it, everything was always balancing it out. The key is watch your margins and do your best to maintain your margins, but never never cut the quality. So we would try to work on cutting things like getting a better price on the cargo box, because that's irrelevant. <laughs> yes? I'm just curious, I know you said that like, the chocolate chip was your favorite. Do they still consult you on new recipes? Because it seems like they have new flavors in the store. Also. Yes, they have two new flavors they came out with. I did not develop those. Um, they didn't even ask me, though. <laughs> <laughs> Which are they? Uh, some more and uh, coconut. Blondie something? Yeah, I saw the sort of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Is it hard not being included now? Um, it's not hard being not hard being included, but it's hard when they introduce new cookies and I don't like them. Because <laughs> my name is on the back. I'm like, I didn't like them. <laughs> but it's all part of letting go. Which um, you know, when, even when they change the logo <clears throat> and I drop past the store, they had my what I thought was my beautiful sign. And they put up the other sign, which I didn't like so much. But you know, I'd have to, I'd look, and then I just have to give myself my own advice and just say, take a breath, let it go. Tell yourself, I love my life. <laughs> and push the gas. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Do you watch Shark Tank? And do you, how do you think you would fare on Shark Tank today? Ah. I've only seen it a couple times, and I I ask myself that I I, I wonder. Um, I don't know if I would have fared well, honestly, because um, a lot of people told me I would fail, and you know I couldn't make a living on cookies. As a matter of fact, the first bakery I rented, two bakeries prior to me renting, failed, and people said, "Why are you renting that? Two bakeries failed," and I said, "Because they weren't any good." <laughs> and uh, I actually had to, I'm a, in the Southampton of the Spur, they do this um, uh, shark tank with the local businesses and, and give out $50,000, and, and I'm a judge on that. Oh. Right. And then I, 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 the first time I was a judge on it, they put in the Southampton Press, and then they said, oh, you know, like, that I was kind of hard. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, I just, I just asked. Point to direct questions. <laughs> <laughs>
So we'll, we'll see. Maybe I'll be softer. This time. Well, tapes come out with a soft cookie opposed to a crispy cookie or something? Probably not. Um, but I have no idea. Uh, I say probably not because based on my experience, uh, a soft cookie doesn't have shelf life without some type of added ingredient. And since we kind of pride ourselves on being an all-natural high-end product, which Mondelez wants to maintain, I don't see that happening unless um, they figure that out, which with their resources they may be able to. Any other questions? Are the other items in the beef shop all your recipes? Yes, mo most of them. Um, some, a few things have changed along the way, but uh, most of them, yeah. I, you know, we would just um, develop. And now my, my thought process, <coughs> when I would develop a recipe, I'd make something, and then I'd give it to the staff, and they'd eat it, and they'd be like, this is good, this is good, this is good. But then I'd watch them. Now, they tasted it and said it was good, and walked away, and didn't turn around and come back for another piece, then I would say it's not good enough. And they were like, no, no, no. And I'm like, no, no, I think maybe if we do, mm -mm. and so then I would make it again, and they're like, oh, yes, this is much better. <laughs> you know, their palate wasn't as discerning as mine, um, but it had to be, it had to be somewhat addictive. You, you couldn't just have a bite and walk away. No, because good is not good enough. Yes? Are there anything that you're thinking about, particularly for the future, um, for your next chapters, if you wanted the next chapter, or from general? Um, uh, no, uh, I, I, I'm not thinking about anything in particular, um, except kind of just you know having fun and traveling and doing whatever. I've had. Um, some request to either write a book or, or do like write a screenplay for a movie or whatever. But you know, I didn't want to write a blog, so <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, mm, that's really invasive. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see what the universe puts in front of me. But right now, I'm just kind of having fun. Yes. Did eventually decide to write a book? Are you allowed to with your agreement, even though it's your life? You know, it's very funny because I said, um, wow, I said, I wonder if I even can do that. I better ask. <laughs> but I didn't ask yet because I, I did, was not inspired yet to go that far. <laughs> yes? Do you uh, cook as well? Yes, I like, I like to cook. Okay, one more question. Um, I know that we've asked a lot of questions here, but um, <coughs> online, how many emails do you, um, you know, and questions do you get like every single like, you know, not year, but how much do you like, you know? Well, me, uh, not very much. I don't have a Tate's email anymore, so I don't even get nice treatment in restaurants anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I miss that Tate's email. <laughs> like a reservation is bad. Yeah. Yeah. I like being invisible, except when I'm in a really good restaurant. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't, I don't get a lot of um, emails. I get requests. I do some mentoring, you know, um, and I'll do like a one-hour thing with people. They find me that that way, and uh, but that's it. I'm not harassed or bothered. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, Kathleen, we'd like to uh, just show you a small token of our oh. appreciation. So you know, here we have a, a culinary hoodie. Oh, wow. uh, from the building, we have some wine from Long Island. And most importantly, we'd really like to see you in this building again. Okay. So we're inviting you to one of our uh, public dinners here that we have oh, uh, three or four times a semester in hopes that you bring a guest and uh, enjoy the fruits of the labors of a lot of these students here. Awesome. I would love that.